Greetings and welcome to another episode of the Owlings Podcast Project. My name is Martin Wilsey and I'm your host. Tonight we're going to talk about foreshadowing. Um, it's, uh, it's an interesting topic. It's an excellent tool for authors if they can do it right. So tonight we're going to go around the room and we're going to talk about how we do it, how we see it authors we like, how they do it, um, and um, if we use them at all. Uh, I guess I'll go first. Um, I personally, as a writer, I, I love foreshadows. I love them. I, you know, I, I love the vibe that they give you if they're effectively done and, and you know, and you can uh, sense them. It's like, ooh, foreshadow. Um, maybe. And because um, there's red herring foreshadows as well. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, as a writer, though, I'm a serious plotter. I plot my stories out in, in very, very, very fine details. And because I do that, I actually see my foreshadowing in, in pretty great detail uh, before I even write the book. Now, things can change as you write them. And, and um, go through, uh, foreshadows can change, they can be enhanced or minimized. Uh, foreshadowing, for instance, is gonna be a big deal in my uh, next book, uh, which is uh, about time travel. And the foreshadowing is a little bit more than just foreshadowing. Um, so uh, for me, uh, foreshadows are a great tool. I love using them. Um, my wife seems to think that my foreshadowing is a little, a little bit too esoteric and they go whizzing right by her every time. And uh, um, I don't know if that says more about what? her or about me. No, but that's but, the beauty uh, of a good uh, foreshadow. She's my first best reader. And mm -hmm. um, uh, he, typically she's the one that can detect foreshadows if we're like watching a movie. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, foreshadowing is a big tool. Um, a lot of authors that I read, um, good foreshadows are what can make me read the book again. Now yes. that I know what happens that's, in the book, you can exactly. go back and you can, you know, uh, realize that he was dead the whole time. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, foreshadows are great. It's a really great tool. I love, I love reading them. I enjoy writing them. And uh, that's it for me. Well, Jay, why don't you go next? All right, yeah. Um, no, I definitely am a fan, a fan of foreshadowing. Um, I actually might be in the camp of saying that there really is no such thing as a reveal unless you foreshadow it uh, beforehand. Otherwise, I suppose it could just kind of be something that you conjured up <laughs> out of nowhere. Um, and so that's, that's actually one thing that I do when I have to revise a draft. Um, if I want to include a new reveal or change something about the plot, um, I have sort of like a magic rule of three where I want to go back into the draft and plant at least three foreshadowing um, sentences or scenes that make that new reveal in my next draft not seem like it was just made up out of thin air. Um, so that, that's kind of a, a little formula I follow, but of course that could be, that could be changed. Some, some, uh, some things only need one strong piece of foreshadowing. You know, and other things might need a lot more breadcrumbs uh, dropped throughout. I'm also a bit of an unintentional foreshadower, which I think is maybe a skill that I've developed after writing manuscript after manuscript after manuscript, um, is, you know, in my first act, I'm pretty good at dropping tools into the, into the prose that I can come and pull back uh, or pull from uh, in my third act. Uh, and I may not have even noticed that I dropped them. For instance, you know, there could be uh, a book that I mentioned uh, in great detail, um, or someone has like a hooked hand. And I may not know at first why that person has a hooked hand, but then in the third act, I, I can pull on that and say, oh, I got it, he had a hooked hand because he was involved in this or, you know, whatever. Or that book may come back to be more than a book. You know, maybe it actually is a living sentient object um, that I didn't plan for, but I, I can pull it into my third act. That's a, that comes from my, my pantsing background. Um, but I, I do encourage you in your first act, even if you're not sure what you're going to be using it for, uh, make sure that the details and the attention that you're dropping in your first draft to items or characters 
is rich enough that you create for yourself a garden for which you can return to and harvest later on um, if you're like me and you don't plot as, as well or as much. Um, but when it comes to plotting uh, and foreshadowing, I, I'm a big supporter, all for it. Um, I've done it a couple of times, but I think I, I really have leaned more on my, um, my, my blessing, I guess, my skill of being able to uh, plant those things early on and come back and harvest them. But uh, yeah, so I, I, I encourage it and foreshadow as much as you can. Don't, don't let things just pop out of nowhere. Don't make up rules out of nowhere to get yourself out of a bind. Uh, foreshadowing can, can uh, validate, uh, validate, is that a word? Validate. Foreshadowing can validate your, uh, your, your reveals. So do it. Yeah, foreshad a foreshadow is like what keeps a lot of stories from being solved at the end by deus ex machina. Right. And, exactly. And, uh, uh, properly foreshadowed um, uh, prevents that. Yep, exactly. Yeah, that is David. Very true. Sure. Uh, so I think you have a lot of power as the author of a story. I think you get to control what the reader knows and when they know it. And foreshadowing is, is a very big part of that. Um, you've heard of Chekhov's gun, where if you, if you show a gun in, in Act 1, you should use it in Act 2. Uh, I would add to that, um, you should surprise the user how it's, it's used. Maybe it's not uh, going to be used the way it was expected. Um, I also think uh, there's kind of a rule of thumb that says if you're going to do some foreshadowing, I think the minimum is uh, that you show it, you mention it, and then you use it, um, meaning you hide it in different ways. So your first mention could, your, your first foreshadowing could be something in a description. Your second uh, mention could be uh, the char a character referring to uh, whatever aspect of foreshadowing you're dealing with. And the third could be uh, something along the lines of, of it, you know, the gun is actually being used. So then the reader, if, if they're paying attention, or if they look back, they can see, oh, it was set up. There were two previous occasions when it was, when it was used. And maybe uh, your, clue, you, your, your problem is larger and you need a little bit more foreshadowing. Um, Brandon Sanderson, a uh, big, big name fantasy writer, uh, is known for having um, a lot of setup in his novels. Uh, and then, uh, then his novels end in what people sometimes refer to, refer to as the Sanderson landslide, where everything gets really fast paced and comes together very quickly. And the things that he set up and the foreshadowing he's done in the, in the early part all gets used in different ways in the climax of the story. Um, my stories, uh, clearly Sanderson outsells me and, and everything. Um, I tend to write science fiction and fantasy stories with kind of a crime angle. So I have to do that too. I have to do an awful lot of setup. I need to make sure that the, the, the readers understand what they need to know in order to understand the climax of the story when it comes. And so there may be very different aspects of foreshadowing that I have to work into the story. Um, I'll also say that I don't think, um, you know, it's kind of like you can, I'm a plotter, you can plan the foreshadowing. I think there's always this evaluation period after you've written the first draft where you go back and, and go, am I too obvious? Am I not obvious enough? You know, somebody's always gonna guess it, but you, you wanna, when your climax happens, you want the reader to go, oh, oh yeah, that makes total sense. I understand, wow. Um, and that's, kind of what I'm going to foreshadowing. Um, I hope that helps. I'll, I'll turn it over to Jeffrey this next. For Jeffrey Hobson, speaking of uh, David saying that some people are always going to get it and then others uh, won't. I, I agree that's a very fine balance of, you know, coming on too strong or not coming on strong enough with your foreshadowing. I remember one time, David, at uh, the Arrowings meeting, I was bringing overboard to you guys the book that I'm going to be publishing this year. Um, and I guess I, I guess I won't I don't know. When, when will this podcast come out? By the time I give the reveal here, maybe the book will already be out. I don't know. But, but I'll, I'll, I'll just not say what the reveal was, but um, there was a big reveal um, in that book that I brought to the table that day to get feedback on it. And I would say that everyone but you, I would say, David, said, oh, wow, really? You know? And David said, well, I mean, 
there really is only one option, you know, it had to be, it had to be that. Uh, and you figured it out, you know, it was, it was, I don't know if you were, maybe you were slightly surprised, but you weren't like shocked. I don't know if you actually like all along were thinking, oh yes, she's doing this. Um, but uh, yeah, so, you know, there's, there's one example of one person's always going to get it. And usually it's going to be David. So if David gets it, don't fret because uh, the other people at the table were, were surprised. So I was okay with that. I am, I, I am older than I like to admit to, and mm -hmm. I have awful lot of fantasy and science fiction. There you go. <laughs> well, and then okay, my friend, Jeffrey. Uh, my friend, well, I mean, just to comment on that, I mean, my good friend, uh, 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 Libby Klein, who writes uh, mysteries, cozy mysteries. I mean, no, you can never get anything past her. But anyway, you guys said everything I wanted to say, so thank you. No, I'm just kidding. But anyway, <laughs> seriously, uh, I'm going to just go back to what one thing that Marty mentioned, because it was one of the points that I wanted to touch on. Deus ex machina. This is the perfect cure for deus ex machina, because think about this. If you write something and the reader goes, WTF, I mean, really? You don't want that to happen. You want your reader to go, oh, and that's why he mentioned it in act one. You, you have a perfect opportunity through your, 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 um, your flash forwards or your, your, uh, Foreshadows. Foreshadowing, thank you. If, through your foreshadowing, that uh, will basically mute the reader's incongruity of reading that potential deus ex machina. If you basically set it up that the reader is seeing that something like that could happen by foreshadowing, the reader will nicely slide through your, your cool ending by saying, hmm, I guess that's reasonable. And I certainly do like foreshadowing. I mean, that's, as Marty said, it's a reread. You go through that book and it makes you want to reread it because you remember these, these sort of niggles in your back of your head saying, hmm, I think there were references to that earlier in the book. And now you want to read it again just to make sure that you got that reference earlier and now that you know what's going to happen next. Uh, it is a great, it's, it's a, 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 I mean, wouldn't it be nice if people read your book twice? Think about it. It's absolutely a great uh, hook for uh, potential readers. Um, and, and honestly, I like writing them myself. I, but I will admit that uh, some, things, some things are foreshadowed in, my, in the novel I'm working on now that uh, aren't necessarily in my outline. Because I think to myself, hmm, this might be nice to put here and I can use it later. Things like, uh, you know, maybe someone's attacked. And I didn't intend that, in, intend that in my outline, but, oh, that's gonna be uh, a perfect payoff later uh, to show what happens. So sometimes as a, as a plotter, you do see the foreshadows and you're probably gonna come up with better foreshadows in your, in your plotting. And believe me, I do have a plot. Uh, I do have an outline of what I wanna do, but sometimes you're just inspired and the little people in your head talk to you and say, use this here because you're going to use it again later. Yeah, I think that I have in the past, um, just in the writing and early chapters, um, I've written something that later I turn into a foreshadow on it because it just works out really good. Mm -hmm. I think that that's more of the, the Shea model of writing uh, mm -hmm. foreshadows mm -hmm. that you put something in and you realize oh my god he he left the garden hoe there that's really handy in the third act or something you know that's uh yeah um that you realize that's that's there so and foreshadows are important um yeah. read, readers love them mm -hmm. and um it can uh really uh make or break a book really if you do them well if you do them badly, people see them. Right. I mean, the, the or see the, the lack of them. I yeah. think even um, foreshadowing in a couple ways. Uh, I think mostly uh, I, you see foreshadowing um, in terms of what might happen, but I've also seen foreshadowing used to provide context or meaning to what's going to happen, say, in the finale. And the, the only example I can think of offhand is. Rocky, 
where he just wants a chance. Uh, and then later on in the movie, they tell you he just wants to go the distance to prove that he's not a loser. He doesn't necessarily want to win. He just wants to go the distance. But they have to get the, that foreshadowing in um, to support the ending that happens. Other, otherwise, you'll be underwhelmed by the, the fact, uh, by basically how the, the boxing match at the end ends. So right. that's kind of foreshadowing to provide context for the ending, which I, I, I feel like you see a lot less often. Hmm. And, and I would just, uh, you know, just to go off what you were saying about uh, Chekhov's gun. I mean, the thing is that if some readers will go into a book and kind of expect a little bit of, uh, you know, foreshadowing and read into a gun that's on the mantelpiece or a quilt that has a interesting pattern in one of their squares that the author shines a light on and say, ah, they're doing a Chekhov's gun. And then you will make the reader annoyed when you do nothing with it. So you gotta be mindful. If you're gonna highlight something as if it's a foreshadow and then you don't pay that foreshadow off, you kind of get your reader, if not throwing your book across the room, but at least a little annoyed with you. Well, it's, it's if you do that herring. right, it's a red herring. I, I, I that, well, the red herrings though, especially in a mystery. Yes, those are very important. Red herrings are critical to writing a good mystery in terms of, oh man, the guy with that was always carrying that suitcase around. He's not the murderer. You just thought he was, but. But a, a red herring and an unresolved thread are two different things. So yeah, I can yeah. see what you mean. Yeah. But you can also do something fun, for instance, uh, in the first, uh, let's say in the first chapter, you show the gun in the desk drawer um, mm -hmm. and you, you show um, one of these little thumb drives next to it. Um, well, it turns out that what really matters is the thumb drive and not the gun. Right. Then you're, then you're playing with the reader. They, you, they know that you were playing with them and they're amused because they didn't see it coming. Now, maybe mm -hmm. that's an example, but you can, like I said, you can confound expectations, but you have to, you have to basically kind of communicate that one way or another to the, to the user. Right. The, the, right. It doesn't always have to be a gun. That is very, very much true. It can be the data drive. Well, when it comes to podcasts, the biggest foreshadow for the end of our podcast is when we all start waving. So thanks for another show. I well, hope I hit the stop recording button appropriately this time. Yeah.